Uh, well, that was a great prelude to talking a little bit about Android, uh, which uh, Steve mentioned once, Dad, over 60 phones based on Android available today, 60, 60 phones. And we've already announced that there's about 200,000 phones selling every single day. So that's well over a million phones per week based on Android. The phones are selling, uh, the 60 phones I mentioned, that's 21 different OEMs, so 21 different hardware manufacturers are building Android-based phones. Uh, 59 different carriers across the globe in 49 different countries are selling all of those handsets. And the Android market has over 70,000 apps. And the great thing about, from my standpoint, about this story, uh, now that I'm actually a, a venture capitalist in Google Ventures, uh, as my current role is that this is a story of a startup, which a lot of people don't know. Android started as a startup company. It was fueled with a rocket engine called Google, which helped it to get to where it is today. But, uh, but it, it started with four guys, four co-founders, and another small team, and, uh, and was acquired by Google back in 2005. And I thought I'd just give you a quick glimpse because I know a lot of people in the room are entrepreneurs building their own mobile products or interested in the mobile ecosystem. So I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a, a glimpse into what it was like and in terms of the history of Android from you know sort of conception through acquisition. There were actually four co-founders of Android, myself, Andy Rubin, who still runs the project uh, back at uh, Mountain View in our, our Mountain View campus. Nick Sears, who's also still part of the Android team, uh, and also Chris White, who's not at Google anymore. And Andy, uh, I had known, like many startups, there was a core team, and this core team all had sort of connected tissue that connected us together. I had known Andy from his previous startup called Danger, which if you guys recall, the T-Mobile sidekick with the swiveling screen, Andy's previous startup had built that device I was at Orange at the time, European mobile phone company, and we invested in Danger. Um, and because uh, back then I was also a VC with Orange Ventures, and so uh, so that's how I knew Andy. Andy knew Nick from his uh, dealings at T-Mobile, because Nick was a VP at T-Mobile, having helped to launch the Danger device. And Andy also knew Chris White from his prior work at Web TV. So there was this connected startup group, and Andy had been working with Chris on an OS for cameras. Uh, and he was trying to walk up and down the Sand Hill Road and get people to support his concept for an OS for cameras. I started talking to him, Nick started talking to him, and Andy had already, I think, known this, that it's really about an OS for phones, which was needed. I was at Orange at the time, <clears throat> at the time, and I had launched the first Windows mobile phone, which actually back then, this was close to eight years ago, back then the first Windows mobile phone I thought was a pretty impressive phone. Uh, and in fact, as, as an executive at Orange and with sort of one hand at Orange Ventures, I thought that my vision of the future, if I project it out and you left it up to carriers and handset manufacturers, I thought Microsoft might own the phone that was in everybody's pocket because I thought that 1.0 phone eight years ago wasn't bad and if Microsoft did its typical by version three, it was gonna be a pretty good phone. So we invested in a company called Savage which was building a Java OS and that's where a lot of my kind of thoughts for an open OS were sort of solidified in that first investment. Savage wasn't that successful with their Java OS, but in talking to Andy and Chris and Nick, it seemed like the time was right, just about a year and a half after that Savage investment, to do a Linux-based handset platform. Linux had the power, the CPU processing power was there, the time was right, good confluence. And so, you know, it was around that nugget of the pain point that I saw as a carrier, the pain point that Andy had as a, sort of an initial entrepreneur building a handset at Danger. Um, Nick Sears had also been at a carrier and had sort of seen the challenges of a carrier wanting to deeply brand handsets from Samsung and Motorola and T-Mobile. And so you had this world back then that was very broken. The carriers were frustrated at the handsets. Uh, the developers, forget it, it was almost impossible for us to get our apps on phones. If you were developing apps back then, you remember all of the different variants of Java that you had to deal with. Trying to get your app on the carrier stack, you'd sort of go to the mountain with your app, walk into the boardroom, try and pitch these marketing execs that they should let your app onto their phones. You only had to do that at every single carrier where you wanted your app to be listed. Uh, so it was almost impossible for developers to get apps out to the market. 
it was, it was kind of a crazy world. And so we started Android with this premise. We did want to have an open OS back then. We had a business model uh, based around building a platform for carriers. And, uh, and as we went out and started to pitch, we were happened to be at Google thinking that they might like an open handset. We weren't trying to sell the company. In fact, we had term sheets for our Series A financing, uh, which we never closed because we got acquired before then. But we, we were talking to people, and, and Google, it, this just sort of resonated with them. They thought it was a bad idea, of course, if any one company, like a Microsoft or whoever, owned a platform that was that important. This was at a time when you remember Google was investing heavily in Firefox and ultimately Chrome, but our goal was to make sure there was good competition and there were other browsers available so that uh, people had choice and there were open, flexible browsers that people could have. It was the same on the handset platform. We just thought it was a bad idea if any one company controlled a platform where there were a billion plus, you know, now 1.6 billion mobile phones sold every year and maybe nobody should control that. So, so our sort of vision of what we wanted Android to be resonated with Google. And, and fortunately for us, we, we ended up there this was back, uh, as you can read in the Wikipedia history, uh, uh, back in mid-2005 that we were acquired. Again, we were sort of pre-financing, so we were still financing the company ourselves. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we hunkered down and did a lot of development work. It wasn't until November of 2007 that we actually announced that we were building the OS, what it was. We announced our Open Handset Alliance, that we were building it with lots of partners, and we announced that we were going to ship the first phone in September, well, actually in Q3 of the following year, we said. Uh, and we also um, announced that we were going to launch the SDK so that developers could build uh, applications for the platform. And I'd say other than the Open Handset Alliance, all of that was exactly on target with the vision that we had had several years earlier when we started the company. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's very likely that Android would not have materialized the way it had had it been acquired by any other company. The commitment that Google had to the project and, and to openness and to a lot of the principles and other things that we did, it's hard to imagine any other company having, uh, having such a similar commitment. You have to realize we said we were going to open source all the code that, that we were going to spend many years building. Uh, we were going to give it away. There was no direct business model. I mean, obviously and thankfully now, we're seeing a business model materialize, and I think Google did believe that these were just handheld computers that ultimately people would consume content through uh, and that we would be able to monetize through our ads and, and other services. But back then, all of that was sort of speculation because you know, when we were acquired in 2005, the mobile web as we know it today certainly didn't exist. So commitment to open source. Um, uh, let's see, what else from my notes here? Because uh, maybe I don't remember. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, in fact, I saw the local uh, localytics guys giving away millions of dollars. We wanted to have a developer's challenge where we were just going to give away millions of dollars to people who were building apps to encourage that app development that Google uh, was very supportive of. Um, and also letting the founding team of the project, as I said, Andy Rubin, uh, my co-founder, is still running the project back in Mountain View, letting the people with the original vision take control of a project that's ended up being that strategic and core and running with it uh, and, and delivering on it. So, you know, like I said, I think I, in my own mind, as I imagine any other company who would have acquired Android, I just don't think you would have ended up at the same point. And, and I think there's one big important lesson for anybody out here that's doing a startup that I will suggest that you do, which is be at the right place at the right time when you're starting. <laughs> And there's sort of two dimensions to that. One is, Android couldn't have happened at another point in time. Uh, there was this strong confluence of lots of things. First of all, CPU power, uh, the technology of larger uh, high fidelity screens and, and touch input, uh, uh, the memory that these devices have, the battery life, all of these things that you really needed to start having uh, a powerful OS power these handheld devices and do it in a way that you could sort of get desktop experience or near desktop experience. You couldn't have done that at any other point in time. It was also a point in time where all of the other players, except for Apple, um, I'd say, were fumbling. Microsoft fumbled horribly. That, remember, I said eight years ago I was concerned about Windows Mobile. Um, 
we might still be concerned about you know Windows 7 mobile now because it seems like you know Microsoft has, has you know been on its game on a few of the things that they've done. We'll see. But the fact of the matter is there was a huge amount of time where they lost their way. It seemed Nokia seemed to have lost their way for a while. Uh, all the other players, Motorola, admittedly, you know, and has now embraced Android. So, um, you know, for us, all of these things sort of lining up and and enabling Android to be able to achieve what it's been able to achieve was was tremendously important. And then, of course, you know, talking to Google about it at the right time so that this key technology was able to find a home that could nurture it and enable it to be uh, to be what it's become. So. You know, from, from again, my standpoint, having been able to see that entire progression, it's refreshing to now see business models, ecosystems, app developers, and other things all falling into place to take advantage of what, uh, what we set out to build so long ago.